All right, uh, welcome everybody to this eGrow webinar today. Uh, my name is Nathan Jonke. I'm a PhD student here at North Carolina State University under Dr. John Dole. I recently finished my master's this past summer working with uh, geranium and poinsettia unrooted cuttings and liners. And today I'll be presenting some of that information to you with a presentation titled Thinking Inside the Box, uh, What the Shipping Environment Does to Your Cuttings. So with that, we will get started. So the outline for today is gonna to start with some background information on cutting production and shipping, and then we'll move into unrooted cuttings and a couple experiments I did with poinsettia storage and then looking at ethylene and botrytis on geraniums. Then we'll move into liners, looking at different temperatures and botrytis development when those are shipped. Finally, I'll end with some recommendations uh, with the research that I went through. So looking at where unrooted cuttings come from, uh, most unrooted cuttings are produced now in Central America where stock plants are maintained due to uh, lower labor costs as well as better environments to grow the cuttings. And those are imported into the United States. Those are then shipped to a variety of either growers that root their own cuttings or rooting stations that develop what we call liners and some people also call them plugs. After a liner is produced, they're sent to another grower who then finishes the crop and either directly sell, sells it or um, sells it wholesale to another grower to then get it to the consumer. So it's approximated that about 1.5 billion cuttings are actually imported into North America every year. And this process takes about two to five days. So from harvest uh, to packing to importing and finally getting to the rooting station, uh, it's pretty variable, um, but we're usually shooting for two days being our best option. And during that time, we really have limited control over the box environment and especially weather. Uh, on the picture on the bottom here, I have some ice packs circled in this box of cuttings. So ice packs are used to help cool those cuttings, keep the temperature down while they're in that box. And sometimes during um, cool seasons, we're gonna use uh, styrofoam or something like that to help insulate those cuttings. But that's really only the, the only protection that this box of perishable material has. Looking at the middle picture, we see liners here and those are boxed in the picture on the right here. And with shipping liners and boxes, there's really no temperature control either unless you have climate controlled transportation. Uh, if you're using something like FedEx, you're pretty much open to whatever that box is going through. And then weather also is a big predicament is if we get delays for some reason, those boxes are gonna be sitting in unfavorable conditions. Two species I'll be focusing on uh, throughout the presentation are geranium and poinsettia. And most of all for their um, industry importance, uh, geranium being one of the top floriculture species and then poinsettia also being very important. Here are some general shipping and storage recommendations. Uh, we wanna keep our transit times very short. Two to three days is optimum. Four days is okay, and five days we're getting in some danger here to see some stressed out plant material. Also keeping our temperatures low, uh, so sensitive species that have a little more, uh, little more native to tropical regions, of, so we wanna keep those around 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So things like uh, sweet potato are gonna be um, one of those that you don't wanna keep lower than that. And then more cold tolerant species, uh, 35 to 50, uh, poinsettia, you don't want to go lower than 40, uh, but something like geranium, keep it as low as possible, maybe down to 32 um, to keep those plants from being stressed out during shipping and storage. Looking, um, we also want to keep our plant material dry. So uh, after you harvest it, or if you're packing a liner, make sure there's no free water on the leaf surfaces or stems, because that's going to help pathogens develop while they're being shipped. High humidity, though, is pretty helpful because it helps decrease water loss. So we want our plant material dry, um, but not in super dry air conditions. We're gonna look at a variety of post-harvest factors today. Uh, first starting with carbohydrates and water content, then botrytis, which causes gray mold and botrytis blight, then ethylene and temperature. So carbohydrates are produced 
through photosynthesis and used during respiration, which can be uh, moderated by temperature. So high temperatures, our plants are gonna be using more of their energy reserves. And that also those are used for advantageous uh, roots and then further growth. Uh, deficient symptoms are gonna be leaf yellowing and leaf abscission. Water content is really reliant on the pre-harvest conditions. So making sure your stock plants are well watered before you harvest your cuttings and then um, watering in your liners before you pack them, but making sure that the leaf tissue is completely dried out before you put it in that box. Dehydration can occur if temperatures are really high or uh, relative humidity is low. So you'd see wilting or dry necrotic leaves. So first we'll start off with some of the work I did on poinsettia cuttings and looking at storage. Our objective with this was to evaluate the carbohydrates throughout the storage process and also look at wilting uh, during the initial propagation. And we wanted to compare a red and white cultivar and that happened to be prestige red and white star, which are two very important and common um, poinsettia cultivars in the trade. We stored them at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, that's a good temperature for um, multiple species storage and we sampled our cuttings every two days for eight days. So cuttings were placed uh, in plastic bags here um, in, the, in the temperature, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then sampled every two days and some went into rooting and then some were used for carbohydrate analysis. We're looking at the percentage of weight loss uh, over storage time in this graph here with the percent weight loss on our y-axis and storage duration on the x-axis. We start out day zero with a perfectly turgid cutting and even by day two we lose about four percent of our weight and finally at day eight we've lost about eight percent. Our average cuttings were about 1.87 grams and an eight percent weight loss brings it down to 1.72. Now you may not think that this is um, very important for our cutting but cuttings as you can see in this picture here at day eight, those are pretty flimsy. Stems are getting a little wrinkled, petioles are wilting. And to put it in perspective, the average American weighs about 166 pounds and an 8% uh, loss in weight would be 153 pounds. And wouldn't it be great if we all could lose 13 pounds in eight days, but obviously that's not healthy for either us or our cuttings. Luckily, after we put our cuttings in uh, our propagation, so under mist, it didn't matter uh, what storage duration the cuttings have gone through, 24 hours under mist brought our cuttings back to full turgidity. Looking at our root ratings uh, throughout the storage duration, so we rated roots after 28 days on these cuttings and the highest, the highest root rating was a five, so that's um, multiple large long shoots with a lot of um, adventitious roots. And Day zero, we got a good rating of about two, which actually increased uh, by day two. And then we started to see a decline after day two. And you can see um, what that cutting sort of looked like at day two in the picture there. Here we have um, Prestige Red and White Star. So we're comparing those two cultivars. Looking at the weight loss, we really didn't see any differences. But in the root rating, we did, with White Star actually having a little bit better rooting uh, compared to Prestige Red. So that was a little interesting because usually uh, white poinsettias are considered a little bit less durable. Uh, here we have fructose and glucose, two of the carbohydrates we looked at. And we saw that White Star also had higher concentrations of both of those sugars. Total sugars on the bottom uh, incorporate sucrose. So our fructose and glucose are reducible sugars. So those get broken down into smaller sugars that can be transported within the plant. And so White Star also had higher concentrations of total sugars. Here is a graph uh, comparing the two cultivars. We've got Prestige Red here and White Star here. And this is looking at uh, the total carbohydrate content of fructose, glucose, and sucrose bro broken up by those uh, colors. You can really see here um, that White Star was able to maintain its carbohydrate content throughout the storage much better than Prestige Red. 
So that is sort of what we were looking for in terms of connecting that to our rooting results. Here we did a uh, correlation test with our rooting and carbohydrate content. And we found that glucose and fructose um, were the second best at correlated to rooting and uh, glucose was actually the best. So we had an R value of 0.4824. Um, so that we would think that glucose is contributing to the rooting percentage that we got. So obviously there's something else going on, but glucose does uh, play a part in our rooting. So I just wanted to recap, recap that uh, point steady experiment for you. Uh, storage for eight days was not really detrimental to our cuttings. We still got okay rooting. Uh, we still had okay carbohydrate content and that would be something to look forward to in the future. Uh, we didn't grow out these cuttings into full plants, so maybe that low carbohydrate content and rooting set back those plants that were stored for six or eight days, but that's something we need to look at in the future. Temperature is also very important. So we were storing our cuttings at 50 degrees Fahrenheit and there was about 60% relative humidity. So if you can go a little bit lower, or maybe amp up that relative humidity a little bit higher, you might get a little bit better storage out of your poinsettia cuttings. White Star did turn out to be a little bit more durable than Prestige Red, which we found uh, pretty interesting since reds were thought to be more durable. But this might also, um, might not pertain to all of the different red and white cultivars. We'd have to test that. Glucose and then the reducible sugars, glucose and fructose were best correlated to rooting. So we've covered the carbohydrate and water content, and now I'm gonna move into a uh, next experiment that looked at botrytis and ethylene. Botrytis scenario, uh, you've probably dealt with this pathogen before as it infects many different floriculture crops, uh, actually over 200 different host species. It grows well from about 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and infection occurs with about four hours of leaf wetness. There's no complete genetic resistance for botrytis, and so we're really reliant on cultural practices and fungicides. Ethylene is an important plant hormone. Uh, you've probably used Ethophon or some other product that uh, releases ethylene for thinning or stock plant management. Uh, but at high concentrations, uh, it can be damaging to plants. So we get leaf yellowing or leaf and yellow or flower abscission. And we control this through keeping our temperatures really low or using ethylene inhibitors. Here's just a sample of um, different ethylene sensitivities of floriculture crops that you can access through the link here. And I just highlighted uh, geranium since that was the crop I was using. So looking at geranium cuttings and we're testing out their ethylene sensitivity and botrytis susceptibility. Our objectives with this project was to determine different cultivars ethylene sensitivity and uh, susceptibility to botrytis scenario and then evaluate the effect of ethylene and 1-MCP, which is an ethylene inhibitor on leaf yellowing and the disease development. And we used four cultivars, Americana Red, uh, Patriot Bright Red, Patriot Rose Pink, and Tango Dark Red. So cuttings were pre-treated with either ethylene or 1-MCP. We also had an untreated control. You can see that in the picture below there. After that pretreatment, cuttings were uh, inoculated with a botrytis spore suspension. So we cultured our own spores, collected them, and then we're spraying them um, with a solution uh, with a concentration of 10 to the six spores per milliliter. We also had an untreated control and just a water control. After they were inoculated, we stored them in mason jars for about four days with a moist paper towel and then rated for leaf yellowing and disease. Here you can see the different rating scales we use to um, rate the damage on our cuttings. So leaf yellowing from a rating of zero to six, we see increase in leaf yellowing from the margins inward and finally six is dead herb sized. Botrytis damage zero to five, we're basically seeing more lesions develop on that cutting until it's completely black. So here we can see the gas pretreatment effect on ethylene production. So we've got our control, which had 
small amounts of ethylene produced after four days. And so these cuttings are completely sealed in mason jars so that ethylene is building up and not uh, dispersing out into the atmosphere. When we pre-treated with ethylene, we really didn't see that much of an increase in ethylene production. However, when you pre-treat uh, plant material with 1-MCP, we saw a drastic increase of ethylene production. And what happens is when you use MCP, it binds to those receptors on plant surfaces, so plants can't sense that there's ethylene in their atmosphere, and they're not affected by it. However, that makes plants produce more ethylene uh, due to physiological processes, so plants produce more when they can't sense it's there. Here we're looking at the pretreatment effect on leaf yellowing. Our controls had quite a bit of leaf yellowing after four days up to just below a rating of three. And that was similar to ethylene, which is interesting. So we didn't really see that much of an increase in leaf yellowing when we treated our cuttings with ethylene. But however, when we looked at 1-MCP, there was a drastic decrease in leaf yellowing. So that meant that 1-MCP was doing its job effectively effectively of reducing leaf yellowing. Here we have uh, our geranium susceptibility. So this is looking at comparing the cuttings that were inoculated with botrytis compared to those that were kept dry. So not a good value of damage on our cuttings that were kept dry. So we actually had some disease development. So that's telling me that there is some um, small lesions or, or uh, botrytis on our cuttings when they're coming in and that can develop with favorable conditions. Uh, however, we did get more disease development with our inoculated um, treatment. And so I look at that and I see Patriot Rose Pink was probably a little bit more susceptible than the other cultivars, whereas uh, Americana Red is a little bit more resistant. We didn't get an increase in damage. Here we have an interesting slide showing the interaction between our pretreatments and then uh, when our cuttings were inoculated. So our controls got a little bit diseased, but when we pretreated with ethylene, we got a little bit more. And with 1MCP, it was able to minimize that damage. So a 1.2 rating is not that different from a 0.8, but there is a little bit of difference there that 1MCP was able to minimize that damage. So in recapping that experiment, we found that cultivars differed slightly in their sensitivity to ethylene and susceptibility. So and that's true for many different hosts of this pathogen, as you get a little bit of differences between uh, different cultivars, varieties, or genotypes. Uh, you're not going to have one that's completely resistant and one uh, that's completely susceptible. So there's going to be a few differences there. Uh, with ethylene, we found a slight increase in leaf yellowing, and it also increased our disease severity a little bit. And then 1-MCP drastically increased our ethylene production, minimized leaf yellowing, and did have a, an effect to minimize that disease severity as well. So we've looked at the carbohydrates, water content. We're still going to touch a little bit more on botrytis. We've covered ethylene, and now we're also going to look at temperature. And to do that, I'll go over a project on geranium liners, looking at botrytis and temperature. Our objectives were this, were first to data log some commercial liner shipments. So figure out what's going on in a commercial setting uh, with those temperatures and relative humidities. Then we use that information to uh, look at botrytis and leaf development on liners when we simulated shipping. And we use those same four cultivars, Americana Red, Patriot Bright Red, Patriot Rose Pink, and Tango Dark Red. Here is a graph of some of the data loggers that we got back through those commercial liner shipments. We had one shipment in April in purple, October in blue and red, and then in December we had green. So this green bar at the bottom is where we'd really like to see temperatures for storage or shipping. And obviously we're not getting that in commercial liner shipments. And these shipments were, um, the liners were put in cardboard boxes and then shipped through FedEx. And you can usually see that two days was about the average time that it took for a shipment to reach a grower, uh, which is good. However, we see a lot of spikes in temperature, a little bit of rise at the beginning, a peak again, a decrease, and lots of peaks. So looking at this information, we wanted to create a 
simulated temperature regime that we could use in our experiments. And you can see that here by the simulated shipping regime. So we're really just following a majority of those peaks and valleys to get a good representation of uh, shipping temperatures. We also wanted to compare that to a, a stable shipping regime. So we chose 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little bit higher than uh, what most species should be stored at um, and a little bit lower than the average. So sort of meeting in between there. So our treatments for this experiment included a inoculation with either botrytis at 10 to the fourth spores per milliliter or 10 to the sixth, and then our spore collection solution. So there's no uh, spores within that, but we wanted it as a control and then also untreated control. Then those liners were boxed up, seen in the picture below here, and then either held at a constant 60 degrees Fahrenheit or at a variable shipping regime that you saw earlier, which ranged from about 50 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. This graph is showing the disease development over time on those different um, spray treatments, as I'm calling them. So we've got the solution in yellow, botrytis 10 to the 6 in orange, uh, 10 to the 4th in blue, and then our dry cuttings in gray. Day zero, no disease development. We move on to day two and day four, we start to see some minor lesions uh, seen here on the picture circled in red develop on almost every treatment with the dry really holding up to um, minor, very minor, small, maybe a few lesions on a couple plants here and there. Day six, we start to see some separation with the solution, uh, which is what we use to collect spores, but no spores in it. And that really happened because our leaf wetness uh, was prolonged. And then our dry actually went up to the level of our inoculants, which was sort of interesting. By day eight, we saw some large lesion development on our liners. And at this point, they're pretty stressed out. They haven't seen any light. They've gotten no extra water. Um, so we're starting to see also some yellowing. So I really want to point out that dry at the bottom in gray. Um, so this is good because we really didn't see any major development in disease until after day four. So as long as you can keep your shipping below that, um, I think you're going to be pretty safe with your botrytis as long as you've had good cultural practices and, uh, fun and uh, pesticide applications before you're shipping your product. Looking at temperature, we have the two different uh, shipping regimes in blue and orange. So the simulated is going to be variable and the stable is at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Day zero, we didn't have any yellowing. Day two, we start to see some marginal leaf yellowing. Day four, we start to see some separation. So the simulated on top here, that leaf yellowing is moving more into um, the leaf while the stable is just that marginal leaf yellowing. We see uh, more separation at day six with some petiole stretching and uh, major leaf yellowing in the simulated. The stable has also moved up. But finally, by day eight, both uh, temperature regimes were pretty much the same. So we had uh, increased petiole stretching and leaf yellowing in both treatments. In recapping that, we found that Liner ship dry were free of disease for basically four days. So keep your shipping times under that. And we're really gonna run into problems when you have delays, mostly due to weather. Shipping temperature differences didn't affect disease development. So whether you're going through variable temperatures or just constant 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is probably gonna be hard to do during shipping, um, there's not gonna be a difference or there wasn't a difference in our disease development. Leaf yellowing, however, can start in less than two days above 60 degrees in dark conditions. So really um, managing that temperature and how you're boxing up your cuttings, making sure they're not sitting in your greenhouse and warming up before they get picked up to go out on delivery, uh, that's gonna be really important. Variable temperatures can also cause increased yellowing. So the more you can do to keep that internal box temperature constant, the better. So if you can convince your growers to do overnight shipping or maybe uh, two-day shipping, the extra cost is probably gonna be worth it, especially during uh, hot periods during the summer. So overall recommendations, um, pack your plant material dry. 
Again, slight dehydration uh, might not be as detrimental as you think. And then any free water is gonna equal disease. So keep your plant material dry, but well hydrated in its substrate and humidity. Maintain constant cool temperatures. Uh, so again, maybe ensure overnight or two day shipping. And then if you have refrigerated transport, uh, definitely use it. Uh, limit botrytis development before shipping. So the more you can do before you box that cutting or liner and put it in a stressful condition, the better it's gonna be off for the whole shipping duration and for your grower that you're selling it to. Also unpack your cuttings and liners immediately. Don't leave them in the box. Don't leave them out on a bench. Um, make sure you're, uh, if you don't use them, make sure you put them in a cool place in a cooler and don't leave them in the box because condensation can occur if it's warm and you put it into a cool condition. With that, I'd like to thank uh, some of our sponsors, especially the Floriculture and Nursery Research Initiative for funding this research. Uh, NC State, my committee, Dr. John Dole, Hamid Ashrafi, and Dave Shu. And then uh, Ball, Syngenta Flowers, Lucas Greenhouses, Doom and Orange for supplying plant material and product for me to use, and the Garden Club of America and AFV for providing some funding as well. With that, I will take any questions. Thank you again for listening.